We are recording and bam, we're doing it. Hi, Ryan. Go. Hey, <laughs> good to see you. <laughs> good to see you too. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, my pleasure. Okay, so we have a lot to chat about. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, for those of you watching, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I, my name is Rachel Adams Lee. I'm a real estate agent here in um, Northern California, and I uh, have been doing quite a bit of real estate. I've been in business eight years. Um, one of the things that I'm really passionate about is not only knowing what's happening around the country in real estate, but really focusing hyper locally and being able to share uh all things real estate, whether it's scripts, objection handlers, market stats um, with our community and our clients. Um, and I am fortunate enough to be um, friends with one of my appraisers. I think sometimes people are scared of their appraisers and you're either in fear of them or you feel like you have to just kiss their butt all the time. Um, <laughs> but uh, I have- or, or you outright don't like them. We get, we get some hate, I understand, so. <laughs> I'll give you all the Starbucks cards, I like yeah. you. There we go. Um, <laughs> and so um, Ryan is Ryan Lundquist is a top appraiser in our area. He's super knowledgeable. I don't know any other appraiser who takes their time. He has a killer blog, you guys. Um, he really takes his time and his heart to be able to just share. Like he's passionate about what he does. And I, I don't know many or any appraisers that I can say that about. I'm sure there are. And yet Ryan really just comes from contribution all the time. So Ryan, thank you so much for being here. We are grateful for your time. Hey, I'm really excited. Let's uh, let's jump in and see where this thing goes. All right. So, I mean, I feel like everybody and their mother is wondering how you feel COVID nineteen has affected the real estate market. Um, what you what you didn't see coming, what has surprised you, if anything. Um, so, if you would just take a few minutes and just share with us kind of your experience, we would appreciate that. Absolutely. Yeah, I think, I mean, raise your hand if you've been through a pandemic before, right? And so this is new territory, I think, for everyone. And it's been, it's been, I think at first we had two to three weeks where the market was sort of on pause. It was really subdued. I mean, there was this 45% drop in pending contracts. And, and that's crazy at this time of year because we should be seeing those rise. And so, but since then, the market's been in recovery mode. And it doesn't mean that everything's perfect and you know beautiful on the horizon, but for nine weeks in a row, we've seen pending contracts increasing, you know? And, and, and so I think the, the thing that I guess is, that surprised me about this whole thing is that, you know, buyers have been very resilient and it seems like they're coming back a lot faster than sellers. Now, I think that makes sense though, in some regards, because buyers have, you know, the um, historically low mortgage rates, that's really driving them to the market and sellers just don't have that same sort of, you know, um, uh, what say motivation anyway, there's not something that's really driving them to sell right now, unless they feel comfortable. And so really for four weeks in a row, uh, we've surpassed where we were in mid-March with pending contracts. And so we've, we've, you know, sort of gotten through that and buyers are coming back, um, but listings still aren't up to where they were in mid-March. And so they're still lagging behind. And so in a sense, um, it, it really is that dynamic. That's exactly what the stats are showing that we have this a market that feels really competitive because um, supply and demand seems outbalanced. You know, supply was already an issue in the market before this whole thing began, all right? But the other day when I pulled stats, we literally had uh, 1,000 less listings in the Sacramento region compared to the same time last year, you know? Okay. Or over the past three months, there's been over 2,600 fewer listings hit the market, you know? And so we there's a lot of properties that normally would be here that aren't. And so- right. It's been fascinating to watch. Um, I think a lot of people are still, you know, getting used to things and thinking, do I want to buy? Do I want to, you know, sell? And do I feel comfortable? And do I want to go to the movie theater or the gym? And yeah. do I want people in my home? And so I, I think for those that work in real estate, you know, they, they're watching the market and going like, I'm ready, I'm ready to list your home. But I, I think some people, you know, sellers just, they just aren't there yet. Yeah, yeah. So when, when COVID first hit, um, what did it look like 
for you? I mean, were you walking into homes? Were you doing, I mean, I had someone, uh, an appraiser call me when COVID hit and they said, we aren't walking, we aren't entering homes right now. I'm only doing drive-bys. Can you send me listing photos? And it really surprised me. And yet I also felt like, you know, in this season that we're in, a lot of things are probably going to surprise us. And I know from my perspective as an agent, it was changing every day. You can't go in a home. You're not essential. You are essential. You can, but you have to sign this form and wear the gloves. What, what did it look like in the appraiser world? Yeah. Well, I was wearing one of those breaking bad suits. It's, no, I'm just kidding. No. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. Side note. I am watching that right now. i we are on episode two of season two and I know that everyone loves this show, but it makes me feel yucky when I watch it. I, I'm like, yeah. when do I start to love the characters? Like, just tell your wife you have cancer. Like, I'm having the hardest time watching this show. I know. You know what? But on a similar note, I love any shows that deal with illegal drugs. And you know, <laughs> my, my wife looks at me. She's like, oh, great. Another, you know, cocaine, you know, dealer out of Columbia show. But, you, watch you know. Narcos? Yeah, oh yeah, anything yeah. like that. I, seriously, like, if there yeah. are like, and that's not me at all. I, I'm, I'm square, I but, fair. but man, if there's, if there's smuggling, I'm there. <laughs> but, um, because we're like the non-smugglers, we're like, bring it, show me. Yeah. The drama. What exactly, <laughs> exactly. But um, let's see. And so, in terms of me, though, um, not actually wearing a Breaking Bad suit, but. For a couple months, I really, I didn't go in homes at all unless they were completely vacant. And so I've sort of changed my game, but- yeah, Meaning like the sellers weren't home or they didn't live there at all? Yeah, if someone didn't live there, no okay. problem. You know, someone would let me in, no sweat. But otherwise, yeah, I shifted everything um, and all my private appraisals for, you know, divorce and estate and stuff. You know, clients were really understanding for the most part. Sometimes they said, well, we're gonna postpone things and you know, we'll have you come back later. but. Um, but I've noticed lately the market has shifted. People feel a lot more comfortable with appraisers com coming in homes. And so I'm back to going in homes um, in most situations. If I don't feel comfortable, someone's sick or they, or if they have a problem with me wearing a mask or something, I, that's okay. I mean, I, I'm, you know, I'm going to do what I feel is safe. I want to, you know, I'm saying, you know, make sure that all the lights are on Absolutely. and, you know, make sure that all the doors are open. I literally don't want to touch anything. And when I get the property, I sometimes have to remind people like, okay, can you please open the side gate, open the garage? And I just sit there until they do it, you know? <laughs> so it's kind of weird. Yeah. So with, I mean, obviously, you know, when, when COVID first hit, so we had, uh, I, I only had five sellers pull when COVID first hit, they said, you know what? We don't feel good about it right now. We do want to sell. We're just going to wait until things kind of smooth over. Um, and obviously, you know, there is a decrease in listings right now. Um, I mean, at least for our market, you know, we've got way more buyers than we have sellers. So we're in yeah. multiple offer situations. We offered on a property, um, uh, just, I mean, I had two offers, I've uh, properties I offered on and, and we lost out. One of them was like on the market for like 920 and it went over a million. I mean, and so, you know, we're seeing that. Do you see that slowing down? I mean, when I know like Ryan, what I really want you to tell me is like, can you please tell us the future? <laughs> yeah. If, uh, if everyone clicks on the link and buys my ebook about the future, no, I, I don't have a crystal ball that actually works. It has duct tape all over it. But um, I think, uh, you know, for right now, what we're experiencing is a pent up demand and we've been seeing uh, buyers coming back to the market. Now it's not the same across the country, but a lot of the markets sort of look like this, you know, shape where the market sort of like a check mark, it went down for two to three weeks and then it's sort of gone up for nine weeks. And so it's that check mark dynamic that comes from a data scientist named Mike Del Preti, give credit where it's due. But um, I, I mean, I think for right now, one of the strong um, engines of the market is, you know, it really comes down to mortgage rates. And so, you know, yeah. with mortgage rates, it seems like every other week, it's a new historic record. That's like rocket fuel for the market. And in a sense, I think it, it's almost like a band-aid where it masks, you know, any wounds in the market, the wound of affordability, um, you know, or, you know, going through a pandemic, why has it felt so much more competitive? We go like, well, look, look, look where mortgage rates are at. And so um, I think that a lot of the market, you know, hinges on that. And then if we're to look to the future, I think in July and August, we'll, you know, start to understand a little bit more. Well, what about forbearance? You know, Black Knight data firm says that, you know, 8.8% .8 of, 
U.S. mortgages aren't being paid, but what does that really mean for the market? Well, I think we need time to understand how that's going to play out, okay? Yeah. There's just a lot of doom and gloom, but I, I just keep telling people be objective about um, data and be careful if you work in real estate because you lose credibility if you embrace doom and gloom or paint every single you know data point news story with the doom and gloom brush. And you also lose credibility if all you do is put on those rose-colored lenses yeah. and see everything through a positive light because stats aren't you know positive or negative you know our, our perception can be that way but yeah. it is what it is but i'd say to to watch unemployment very carefully though um and we're just at the very beginning of it in fact tomorrow we'll have unemployment data published for california and this will be our second month in a row with astronomical unemployment rates like all our local counties are above 10 percent so. Okay, so I, this is something I've kind of wondered about. So we have like stock markets, right? And we have unemployment rates and then we have real estate and we have interest rates. How do all of those talk to each other? Because I feel like pe people always say, well, you know, watch the stock market. It's going to tell you what's going to happen in real estate. But watch the interest rates. It's going to tell you what's going to happen in the market. How, what would you say to someone who's who comes to you with all these different numbers? Because, you know, as an agent, I that that's something that I deal with a lot. The seller comes to me and they have, a game plan. Sorry if you can hear someone drilling. We just found mold in one of my walls. <laughs> oh no, totally can't. Yeah, I can't no. even hear it. Good, I'm glad. Um, I'm actually in like my, an, like if you could actually see what's behind me, it's like the desk fixings. It's like, you know, how we just make it work <laughs> in our world. Definitely. Um, so, you know, what would you say? Because I mean, as an agent, I have buyers and sellers come to me all the time and they say, you know, well, we're waiting to put our house on the market. We're watching interest or, you know, we're watching the stock market or we're waiting. And, and what about the, you know, the, the second wave of COVID that we're talking about could happen in the fall? Like, how do you ingest all of that? And then what do you share with people? Well, I think it's tough because sometimes people have their pet metrics and they say it's all about the stock market or it's all about, you know, the how many lattes are being purchased every day in the United States or it's all about like whatever it is. And I don't mean to downplay the stock market with you know, Starbucks, yep. but I think sometimes there's there's not really a connection, you know, and the thing is that you know, what's happening in um, the stock market can influence upper end buyers. It could influence a market where there's a lot of tech companies. Um, but a lot of people don't derive their income directly from the stock market though. And so it may not influence what they can qualify for, for a mortgage um, or, you know, what they have in the bank for a down payment. And so I think that the relationship with the stock market is, is somewhat maybe overblown. Um, not saying that it doesn't matter, but I don't think it's a driver, you know, for whether someone will buy or not. Now, if the stock market's crashing, obviously that affects people's confidence. And it, if consumer confidence changes, then, you know, clearly that's that's an issue over time. And so, but I think it's just your classic, or I mean, right now anyway, how comfortable do people, you know, feel playing the market? And my sense is that there's, different levels of comfort, you know, and some people they're checked out and they're thinking, I'm not going to engage because I'm worried about prices um, going down in the future, or I'm worried about, you know, people, uh, a second wave of coronavirus. And the, the reality is, is it no matter what, we don't know the future. Okay. I think as much as we like to think we do know it, we really don't. And yeah. right now, yes, there's some red flags on the horizon, but I mean, ultimately, I, I just, I sort of turn the table and say, what does your lifestyle mandate? You know, if you need to move, then um, you're going to have to assess whether you're comfortable with the risk. Right. You know, yes, the market could change direction. We've had eight years of price growth. And at some point, the market won't just go up, you know, but where do you want to be? When you look at basically the last three real estate cycles in the Sacramento area, you know, prices declined for six years. And so I think sometimes when buyers are looking at that, I just say, look, here are the stats. And if you want to try to time a market absolutely perfectly, you know, you might be waiting a long time if the market did do something else in coming time. Yeah. But, but I think we just have to realize that most of the time market dynamics and lifestyle dynamics don't line up. Okay. And so it seems like a really simplistic answer, but I find myself having a lot of conversations with people just talking them through that and saying like, look, where does your lifestyle mandate for you to be? I'm not yeah. trying to talk you into anything, move or don't move. It doesn't matter to me, but where, where do you need to be? You know? And so I think that's a big thing, but you know, if people want to geek out, I mean, there's a ton of stats, there's probably too much data out there. Um, yep. 
you know, but the problem becomes, so we, we bring our ideas to the table and we think, hey, the market should be doing this one thing. It should be declining. You know, like I wrote about today on my blog, you know, don't hold your breath for a COVID discount because there hasn't been that dynamic. And like I said in my post, I had an owner of a house that was angry with me because the sense was that this appraisal, you know, should have been way lower because the market's declining. And I, I said, well, it, it's, it's actually not. Right. And so, but your perception is that. And so I think in some regards, we bring all these ideas to the table, but we have to continue to watch stats. Well, what happens with unemployment or what happens when, if the government, you know, juices up the economy or, you know, keeps giving stimulus checks or people have, you know, the, you know, $600 extra each month for unemployment. I mean, there, there's all these ways to sort of, you know, deal with the carnage in the market right now. And the reality is we, we just have to kind of wait and see and, you know, ride this, ride this wave. How, how would a, I had someone sent me this question today. They said, how does a high employment rate, unemployment rate affect the real estate industry? So typically there's a, there's a correlation between um, employment and jobs and home prices. And so clearly over time, if people don't get back to work, then we can expect to see an impact in prices. You know, it's sort of like real estate 101. If we were in a government class in 12th grade, that's what all the students would say. And so, but right now what we don't know, we have a high unemployment rate on paper, but what does this really mean? Is this something really prolonged or is it temporarily high and it's something that's going to be dealt with and, in, in, you know, shrink substantially in, in the next few months. And so, that's what we have to think through and what we have to understand. And right now we just don't have answers, but you know, absolutely. If, if buyers aren't there to be able to buy properties and afford properties, then that becomes a real issue. Now, so far since COVID um, has happened and over the past nine weeks in a row, and it, it'll likely be 10 weeks in a row now, uh, this next week when I pull stats, we've seen very strong buyer demand. You know, how does that continue in the future? Um, I think you alluded to something really important though, like, what happens if there's a second outbreak? Um, and this is where I just remind everyone, like, you know, take care of your mental health. Um, even this week, I started reading about China and they're, you know, you know, restricting things. I was talking to my wife and going, you know what? I need to tune out of the news a little bit because that kind of, it stresses me out. And so I just want to say that, but in terms of like real estate, you know, it's very possible that we could see a more subdued market. Obviously, if we go on lockdown again, then I think the, the person who works in real estate who is wise would look at, at the future and say, if there is a second outbreak, then I ought to prepare for it. Mm -hmm. Then I ought to, you know, pinch pennies and cut expenses and to be frugal and to be really happy in life, no matter how many deals are happening, because there would theoretically be less deals in the future until we work through this. Now, would it look different than our, you know, most recent lockdown? I would think so. Okay, it's, that's been pretty devastating economically. Um, I'm very concerned about commercial real estate, especially. Um, I feel for business owners, but um but that's sort of a, it, it's something that I look at anyway in the future and go, okay, I, that's there. I, I want to, I want to be prepared and, you know, sort of hope for the best, but plan for the worst. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, it's, it's interesting. I think we have very similar mindsets on just we being intentional about having positivity around us, good energy with people. And, you know, I think when you watch, if you, if you pay attention too much to the media, you get sucked down this rabbit hole and it, it can be really dark. And what we have to remember is that our community, our clients, that's what they're seeing. And so when they bring you into their home, when they ask you about the market, you know, not to have rose colored glasses or to be negative, just to be honest and transparent with them. And I think if you sit down and you have that conversation about what's best for your client, where they want to move, why they want to sell their house, or when they're purchasing a house, what does that look like? And making sure that they're, you know, in this multiple offer situation, I just talked to someone else, um, a, a buyer of mine that was offering uh, last night and I and we got a counter and I said, look, if we agree to this counter, it's going to make it so you cannot live your life as comfortably as you do. And, and, you know, of course it's up to you to make the end decision. And yet I want to bring this to your attention because quality of life matters here. And I don't want you to be house poor. So I explained what house poor is, you know, and I think, um, you know, when you're talking to your community and, and, and your clients, like I always share with, with COVID when people are like, what's going on? How's the market? Oh my gosh. Like, you know what are, to be honest with you, the Sacramento market, while it's down a bit, 
it's jamming right now. If you were a buyer, interest rates are super low. So you can get a pretty, you know, great rate on a home. You know, there is a bit more competition because on the flip side, you know, for the sellers out there, you're in a, you are in a seller's market. There is not a lot of inventory out here. So you are in the driver's seat. And I mean, we're every offer that I've put out rate lately, it's been a multiple offer situation. And so, you know, having that conversation with the buyers ahead of time, that they're going to need to be competitive. And this is what this looks like. And, you know, um, and, and just educating everybody right now, I think whether you're talking to a buyer or you're talking to a seller, just being really honest and transparent and educating them on the market. But at the end of the day, doing what's in the best interest of your client. Like if, if my client decides to pull their house, cause it's not best for them. My answer is always, you know, I'll be here when you're ready to sell. Like, this is the job I'm going to have for the rest of my life. Like I love real estate. I'm not going anywhere. So what's ever best for like you and your family, you know? Absolutely. No. And I love that. I think that we can earn credibility in this market by giving people space to make decisions and re and respecting their decisions. And, you know, if they're really looking for numbers, well, great. Well, here's some numbers. Here's the way that we're looking at the market. And, you know, here are the dynamics going on. I think that, you know, in that regard to really master that and to, you know, I, I tell all my real estate professional friends, appraisers and agents, you know, now is a time to really understand the market and to change your narrative, you know, because for years, it's almost like real estate is stuck in clicheville. And I know this is a little bit of a tangent, but I can't help it. Um, okay. But I, I think that we get stuck in this um, habit of talking about the market as if it's this ever increasing commodity or like, it's always a good time to buy and sell. And, you know, and, and, and so we have these rose colored lenses, but I think when a market changes or, or a pandemic happens, even though it hasn't really impacted prices, um, I think it forces us to reevaluate our narrative and say, you know, what can I say about the market? And most importantly, what do people need to hear? What are the questions that they're asking? Or someone just emailed me this morning and said, hey, can you help me understand what the market's doing? Boom, I sent her my blog post this morning. But she also said, you know, um, what sort of upgrades should I do? And, you know, if, if the market's starting to turn, you know, we kind of want to do some upgrades, but if it's starting to turn, you know, we want a list. And so, yep. he, so there's like, there's always different needs in a market. And what I tell friends is to just, you know, understand who are the players in the market, who has incentive to buy and sell right now and to identify those players. I think the danger is, is that when we're, when we let sort of a market pass us and we're not really asking those questions and thinking ahead of the market. So we wake up one day and they go, Hey, where do my clients go? You know, because yeah. yeah. we weren't continually just asking what are, what are the needs of, of my database right now? You know, and it's going to look for, look different for, for everyone. You know, yeah. whether they work in tech or, you know, they're relocating or they work at Twitter and then, you know, they want to buy an Eldorado Hills because they can work from home forever sure. now. I mean, sure. you know, all, all these dynamics. So what, what, what has happened with the market with COVID that has surprised you? Like, did you see this? I mean, obviously you couldn't have predicted a pandemic. None of us can. Like, did you see anything that has really surprised you or that you, that, that maybe you thought would go a little differently than it's panning out? Um, so yeah, in my ebook that I wrote in January, I predicted all of this. No, no, no. Um, <laughs> I swear, I, I can't wait for the gurus to start talking about how they predicted it. Um, oh, they did, they, they totally didn't. Um, I think the one thing that's stood out to me is that it seems like the market has hit its seasonal peak one month early. Okay. And so I know that's not a popular thing to say, but it's what the stats are showing. You know, there's the prices are beginning to, to soften. Uh, it took a one or two days longer to sell in May compared to April. Um, and, you know, it, we actually had less multiple offers in May compared with April. Now, um, and so it, it looks like normally the market sort of does that about yeah. one month later. But and so I, I'd see I'd say that on one hand, it looks like we're experiencing our seasonal descent. But at the same time, we have this weirdness happening where like mortgage rates are so low and yeah. pent up demands being expressed. And so it would be really awkward to start, start, start our seasonal descent and then to go back up. But sure. I, I'm just sort of 
watching going, well, what's yeah. the narrative going to be in the next couple of months, depending on how this goes, because we do have that pent up demand issue. And so it's just, it's kind of strange, but I am absolutely recognizing it's what the stats are showing that um, we are seeing this dynamic. And, and one thing to note and to watch closely is sort of um, inventory above 1 million. It has been a little bit higher lately, um, not astronomically high. Um, I would say the inventory in every price range is, is pretty subdued. But uh, above a million has been a little bit higher than usual. And so I wouldn't write home or sound the alarm, but um, I would definitely watch it and just remind, you know, sellers above a million to, to really price it correctly. Because, yes, we're in a seller's market, but buyers are not going to buy on everything. They're yep. very, very sensitive to price. And if anything, when they're seeing unemployment stats, it's just reinforcing and inflaming that idea that, hey, I want to be cautious about paying the right price and not overpaying. So when we're pricing a house right now, you know, normally we look back six months, we start at a quarter mile radius, half mile, obviously, you know, granted, we know, you know, train tracks and all the jazz. Um, are, does that change at all? Are, I mean, our stats, stats, our facts, facts, sold, sold, like we, does it change at all with the market, with a pandemic or is a sold house, a sold house? So like, is there anything to take into consideration? Cause I know, you know, before it's like, well, gosh, what if it's a short sale, it's a little different than if it's an equity sale. And so is there anything to take into consideration when you're comping a house right now with the current pandemic that we're in, we obviously can't see the future. I mean, I have so many sellers that are waiting to go on the market until things calm down but we don't know because in the fall we could hit another increase in COVID and then it's like what's your thoughts on that yeah so um I would say first of all the thing that's the same is that we see the market the current temperature of the market in the pendings what is getting into contract and so for any sellers I would just ask what's similar that's actually moving because that's those are your comps the sales yep. represent history they tell us what the market used to be like 30 to 60 90 days ago when those properties got into contract but the one thing i think that's really different about this market is that there's less data and so sometimes it's more difficult to see well where is the market and so in some senses i think we have to sort of expand our search really find competitive neighborhoods and go okay well where 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 else would a buyer be searching? Because I need more of a panoramic view so I can see the market. Like I appraised something in Rockland the other day. And I mean, there were like one or two sales in the neighborhood in 2020. And so it, it was, the owner wasn't too happy that I used sales that were eight and nine months old. And I sort of adjusted how the market changed. But I'm like, well, that that's kind of what we have. And just because it's a recent sale doesn't mean it's a good comp. Okay. Yeah. And so it was this one property was just not competitive. And so that's absolutely why I didn't use it. And so I'd say in some senses, we have to look further back in time to understand the market, but also maybe go a little bit further away to, to get more data points. Okay. And so some of these, uh, we'll research it. I'm not going to use a sale probably three years old. Okay. <laughs> but like, I at least want to know what's out there. How's the market been? Because, you know, if our volume's down, uh, you know, this month it was down. Let's see, I have my stats here. Um, you know, 36% or so, um, you know, 38%, depending on the county, um, you know, we are down in the whole region, you know, 36% less sales this May compared to last year. And so there's simply, you know, there's 36% less comps, basically. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you have time for two more quick questions? Yeah, of course. Okay. So this is not COVID related. Um, what is the main mistake? And I'm sure this is a loaded question. What is the main mistake you see real estate agents doing when improperly comping a house? Like you go to the house, you're in contract and you're like, how the heck did they get this number? Ignoring a multiple offer situation or anything like that. Like the, it was actually listed improperly. Like the agent clearly didn't know how to do comps. So what would you say your main, is it going out too far? Is it going back too old? Is it improper? I mean, yeah, I would say the main thing is that using price per square foot um, as the primary tool for valuing a property. And so oh, I'd go, yeah. well, how, yeah. how did you like, how did you value this? Well, look, 425 price per square foot. But as an appraiser, if I'm being hired by a lender to do a report, I don't just say, hey, look, check it out, lender, 425 price per square foot, because the lender's saying, I want to see three comps three sales and I want to see a couple listings or pendings. And so the real estate agent would have been, done a great service to probably the seller and then to the appraiser to just back up and say, what is similar that's actually sold? 
rather than looking at high price per square foot, imposing it on the property, then all of a sudden we're, we're way above what the comps are actually saying. If we would have just looked at the comps, we would probably be within that zone. But then of course the struggle is it gets into contracts, you know, but yeah. sometimes buyers, they offer based on what they're qualified for to purchase, you know, rather than, you know, comps. Yeah. So. And as an agent, I, anytime I offer on a property, I will always comp it before I offer, because I just, I want to know that we have the numbers to support our price. And if we're going over asking what's the highest it could possibly appraise for in, you know, in my opinion, um, and, and how much over asking we're going, and then is it no appraisal contingency? Um, okay. So then when you, cause you are, you do independent appraisals, but then you also get sent out from banks to do appraisals, correct? So I only do independent now. Um, for a lot of reasons, sort of I've diversified and I just do private work. Um, I know a lot obviously about what's going on in the lending world, um, but yeah, just private appraisals. And I actually do appraisals. I have people ask me every week, they say, are you still doing appraisals? And I'm like, yeah, I'm not just sharing market stats, <laughs> but yeah. It's so fun. It's a I problem I have. You move into like a little bit of like the coaching or education space. People assume you're not actually in like, you know, in the field anymore. Yeah. And, well, sometimes people have asked me that like, are you still in real estate? I'm like every single day. Yes. And I'm passionate about coaching. Definitely. Um, okay. So my question around that was that, which was, since you do have knowledge on this, uh, we just disputed an appraisal that came in. Um, we absolutely felt that we had the comps. I was actually, I was on the list side um, and we absolutely felt we had the comps to support the pricing and we submitted it. And in my experience, more often than not, uh, the dispute is um, is thrown out. It's not acknowledged. And, and, and I am like, I don't want to offend the appraiser, but like, yet I really felt we had the value. And in this case, they actually agreed with us and said, you're good to go. You have the value. Like, how, how does that work? I mean, cause, cause you know, if, if we get a little appraisal, we obviously want to fight for the value, especially on the selling side of it. Like, how does that work? Well, I mean, a lender's going to ask an appraiser to reconsider the value. Um, and they sort of, um, they're sort of the barrier between the appraiser and the agent or loan officer. And so sometimes, you know, a, a review appraiser on the lender staff, you know, will see that and go, you know what, this is garbage. I'm throwing it away. There's nothing to argue here. The appraiser won't even see it. And so I think keep that in mind. But, um, but I think, you know, an appraiser, it's okay and it's ethical to change the value um, if there's, you know, new data um, or if there's, I think, a better perception and understanding of the data that was already there. And so nobody likes to eat humble pie, but I think if we're wrong, you know, we, we should admit it and then change it. And the report should completely like reveal that. It should be absolutely transparent. The value was changed on this date for these reasons after reviewing this certain thing, you know, but I think fat chance of that happening. And so my, um, my recommendation is always to start with challenging a low appraisal before the appraisal begins. You know, up front, be very proactive about sharing information because sometimes when a value comes in lower and then the agent's like, well, but there were five offers and there were all these things, all these things. But then you think, well, why didn't you share that information yep. up front? Yep. Why not be proactive without that sort of 2005 old school pressure? Hey man, we need you to hit the number. Like <laughs> that's unethical, you know, like do that when um, the department of real estate is on your you know, inspection. <laughs> yeah. Right. You know, that's yep. not going to happen. And so, yep. but I just feel like I always appreciate when agents share information with me, I want to know about the property. Not every appraiser is going to um, have that approach, but I look at it as data, um, you know, but I also don't want agents to speak in, you know, such vague terms and say, it's a hot market and this pool sized yard is wonderful and it, it's beautiful. And like, like, well, that doesn't do anything for me. If you can give me any data or perspective on the market or the buyer pool, that stuff is golden. I mean, that might help shape my perception of value too. So what I would do, and, and tell me if there's anything you would change with this. So when I have, um, when I'm submitting comps, I will usually reach out to the appraiser and say, would it offend you if I send you the comps that I found? Because sometimes there are those like super curmudgeon appraisers that are just like, I'm the smartest person in the room. I don't need your help. I know what I've been doing. I've been doing this for 25 years, you know, and, and 
um, I've had that response. And yet what I usually say is, would it offend you if I send you some of the comps and I just kind of share with you a little bit about this property? Usually the appraisers are pretty cool and they say, sure. So I send my comps. I send how many offers we have. Um, I share any upgrades in the home that I feel might be beneficial. Um, and, and, and I send them over. Is that kind of what you, is there anything you would add to that that would be helpful from your perspective? Yeah. And so first, I think, I think that's great. Um, I actually have an information sheet I recommend for people to use it basically incorporates all that stuff, but also the number of offers. Um, the It has uh, feedback you got from prospective buyers and other agents, because sometimes it's that values about the perception of the market. And all of a sudden the appraiser understands like, oh, wow, it was, you know, the backyard or it was a school district, or it was, you know, that it looked like Chip and Joe's latest remodel. I mean, like there is something that, you know, the appraiser might need to know. And so I think all that stuff, but, um, but the one thing that I, I'd recommend is to, if you use your own sheet or my sheet, whatever, is just to, you can have your um, data and attach it to the other stuff, the information. If the appraiser doesn't want, um, you know, any sales, then you still have all that other information. So, but I, I just tell agents, don't even call it comps because it's not like, hey, here's what's really comparable, but here's how I price the property if you would like to see. You know, I, I love that kind of language. Um, I, I think that there's, you know, tension between agents and appraisers and anything to help diffuse that. Yeah. It's really, really helpful. And so when an agent shows, you know, respect, you know, whether they don't like me or there's issues or, you know, like, but when you show that respect to someone, it, it helps to build a bridge and it helps to, I think, foster communication. And that's probably a good thing in, in the role of the agent wanting to convey as much as they can about the property. Love it. Well, Ryan, thank you so much for your time today. You are so incredible to just pay this forward as always to our industry. We're so grateful to have you. Um, if people want to follow your blog or get that information sheet, where can they learn more about you? Where can they find you? Yeah, I'm at sacramentoappraisalblog.com. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. You know, look me up. Um, send me an email if you want that appraisal sheet. If you Google something like cheat sheet, information sheet for appraisers, Sacramento, I mean, it should come up too. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time, Ryan. We appreciate you and I wish you Stay healthy and happy and uh, go enjoy your baking bad. If there's any other like crime or like smuggling shows, I'll make sure to like, make sure you're watching. Hey, definitely keep me posted and good okay, luck. Wait, uh, good luck seen, watching. Have you seen billions? You know what? I've seen a little bit of it um, a, a couple seasons, but we have, yeah, I think it was that Showtime or HBO. I don't remember which one. Sure. We We're watching billions. And then there's another one called succession. Have you seen that? You know what? Isn't that about, isn't that a British show? I don't know if it's Succession. I don't, I don't think so. I don't like anything with Downtown Abbey, um, Succession, anything with Queens and Kings. I just. No, there's I, no Queens and Kings. This is like a media family. They okay. like, they're basically like, uh, like if it's like a, it's like if it's as big as Disney, like they own everything, but they're like the super like convoluted and there's like all this like crazy family dynamic. There's no Kings and Queens. Oh, okay. Well, maybe I'll have to watch that. I think my wife watched it. Any, but yeah, anything with Kings and Queens, I, I'm out. I'm so I'm not interested in Got it. No, Check yeah, it. nothing in that genre, but yeah, drugs, okay. cocaine, like let's do this. So cool. All right. Thanks, Ryan. Have a good day, buddy. Thanks, Rachel. Take care. Thank Bye. You. Bye.